right. Hello, Slush. Good to see you. Um, I think starting the Builder Studio about founding teams with Ilkka Paananen is, is really special. And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, Ilkka has not just only started one company, but ac actually co-founded two companies, so Sume and Supercell. Um, but also, uh, secondly, started a non-profit We Foundation, um, invested in tens of different companies through his family office, Illusion, uh, also through Supercell. Additionally, Supercell operates with these small cells, so basically different small founding teams itself, creating the different games. But not just only that. You are on the board of, of Turun Pallaseura, the ice hockey team. You are on the board of Walt and, and many, many others. So I think to kick this right away, Ilkka, when you have a view of sports teams, non-profits, startups, you have invested in tens of different companies, what are the differences between the best teams and the be especially the best founding teams uh, when you compare to these different organizations and, and so on? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. So, um, like, I, obviously, I've been very lucky in my life in a way, in a way that I've had the great fortune of working with like, some really amazing people, some really amazing teams uh, in my life. And, and I think the surprising thing is that uh, I don't think this, the, like, you know, whether the team is on the for-profit, non-profit, even sports, I don't know, like, uh, if there are, like, that big differences. Or at least I've observed, like, many, like, common sort of uh, nominators between these teams, like, and, and not... Not really like mattering like what what field that team actually is in. So in a way, they are pretty much the same. But you mentioned that you have noticed like some common threats. So what are, in your view, those those with the especially with the very best teams, exceptional teams? Well, if I think about the very best teams that I've sort of come across and had a chance to work together with this, that I I think that first of all, like you know, all the best teams like they aim really really high. So, uh, so the level of ambition is high, and say, for example, like, uh, you know, like, so basically what, what they want to do is that, you know, if I talk to, say, a founding team, like, who's based here in Finland, like, I mean, these guys are not, like, trying to build, like, the kind of best product or the best company in Finland, mm. and not even the best in Europe, but they, these guys are aiming to be the number one globally and mm -hmm. being the best in the world, and, mm -hmm. and you know, that I, I think is the kind of the starting point for, for those people, and and, and also, like these teams, they, they usually have a really kind of clear vision what they want to do, mm -hmm. so crystal clear. But at the same time, it's an interesting balance because these teams are also very open-minded about feedback, and they actually welcome people who challenge that vision. And 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 you know, um, but then the, I guess like despite like listening to everybody, then they at the same time they like they do decide themselves, and they kind of take the feedback that they feel is valuable. So it's not that this teams like change the vision like based on like you know who, who they have uh, what kind of piece of feedback they've last last heard so those type of things at this sort of come come to my mind and then i think the third thing is that you know um, these people like they oftentimes they are sort of very different they come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. meaning that you know they like when they need to decide on something there are different perspectives to that that matter but then despite these differences and sometimes even heated arguments mm -hmm. they can get actually aligned behind like one common goal mm -hmm. and there's this kind of mentality of like disagree and but commit to so those those sort of come uh, come to my mind and then there are like, like some like like pretty like it's just obvious things like of course like every single person needs to be world class in sort of their position mm. you know there has to be this like common set of values and culture which is really the foundation that you build everything uh, on, on on top of you know they have to be inspiring because if you if you aren't inspiring as a team then other people around you won't won't join you you can't recruit new new people etc et um, and maybe as a last thing I would say that I, I try to like I mean best teams aren't necessarily and this is interesting, they aren't necessarily like motivated by the outcome, but they actually they truly enjoy the kind of uh, the, the effort, so, so to speak. So, uh, and, and, and especially like uh, as a very concrete example, I, I personally don't get inspired about teams who, for example, have a kind of lofty goal as in like what's the kind of exit going to be or what's the valuation going to be. Mm. You know, I, I don't find that inspiring at all. And I think there's other people like me. So I think there has to be kind of a bigger goal than just money, for example. Right. So you listed like maybe six different things, like aiming world class, having the best of the best team, um, getting excited of, of simply 
building something together, uh, having strong opinions loosely held, and so on. But maybe if you, if you actually change the table from, from being an investor and, and checking these teams and, and kind of like thinking through the lens of should I invest in this company and, and actually like, is this, a, is this the team that can actually uh, execute uh, on the idea that they are, they, are, they are about to do? So what kind of things kind of like, what kind of things go in your mind and, and, and different traits? Like how do you evaluate that, that these people have this? Uh, different things that you mentioned. Well, obviously, it's a it's a discussion, and mm. and oftentimes multiple discussions, mm. and you know, and, and it's just about asking questions and and uh, and you know trying to understand the, 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 the teams and what really motivates them. And you know, I ask questions like, for example, the first thing I say that uh, that for me it, it's very important to like understand like what's the ambition level. Mm. So you, when you ask questions like you know, okay, previously like you know, what's the kind of a the work that you're most proud of and, and you know trying to figure out like where is the quality bar for that person and, and, and you can dive really deep in that topic and is is there a good example of, of a great response that you have got? Uh, no no I, I think there's like a, you know ten I mean there's like tens and tens of great responses and it really depends on a person. So mm. you know I've uh, interviewed a person who, who wanted to um, Join join uh, Supercell back in the day, and uh, and you know that person actually didn't have like almost any work experience, but but then like I I asked like okay, what are you most proud of? What's the best piece of work that you've ever done? And I think this person had a founded a chess club uh, in in the high school, but it was the world's best chess club. And then I asked why, and and, and even more importantly, I asked like how did you know that it's the world's best? And then the person had, you know, had a, this very global, you know, somehow perspective mm. on chess club. By the way, I know nothing about chess, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that just gave me an idea that, okay, this, this kind of individual like, really has this like, global mindset and really always, whatever, you know, she does, you know, always aims as high as possible. Right, right. Um, what, what about the, um, when building companies, uh, we we often talk about execution. Uh, it's a it's a race to find the product market fit, and and you as an investor usually assess the the team and the founder. That does this person have a founder market fit uh, to to specific problem? And I think there is a great quote that uh, investor from Mosaic Ventures, uh, Toby Koppel, said that ideas are cheap, execution is is expensive, and the ability to execute separates people not the ability to come up, come up with ideas. So I'm really interested like, about especially how do you assess whether a certain founding team has kind of like this execution capability to actually make things happen? Well, uh, of course, like execution is ultimately like the best proof of execution is, is just like the, the history. So what have these people done in the past? And, uh, um, and, and actually like the... A, a, a sort of thing that many people and I guess many investors that it used to do was that uh, you know you would take the kind of first meeting with a founding team, uh, and then you, you would like schedule the next meeting in say next three to four weeks, and and this you know this team maybe is like trying to raise money, and and you know back in the old days in three weeks you couldn't raise <laughs> raise money, uh, and and then you basically turn to assess that okay what has happened during these three weeks like with no resources with no funding, mm. and and you know like somehow, you know, the best teams can, you know, get a lot of done with, which, like, basically with no resources. And it's interesting to me, like, if I think about the best, for example, game teams at Supercell, which have been, been born, I mean, usually the way they've been born is it's, it's, it's almost, like, completely organically. Mm. And, and, you know, and nobody has, like, told them, like, you know, what type of game to do or anything. And they put the team together and, and you know, they actually don't have any time to, like, you know, create prototypes and stuff. Mm. But yet... Despite all of those things, things just somehow magically happen. Right. And and you know, I, I think there's like a, that sort of a, is the kind of common trade, uh, you know, between many of the best teams that I've come across. And you know, just the ability to execute uh, with seemingly like no resources. Right. Right. And and then like somehow showing that like what you what you have done with minimal resources in a short time. Yeah. And somehow like things just happen. Like great things just happen. Right. I think there was something, we, we had a short prep call uh, with Ilka for this session, like, just to kind of like have an idea like what to maybe discuss. Uh, but there was something really surprising for me that you said in that call. And, and it went something like this, that the worst mistake you can do is to start a company with your best friend. <laughs> 
Um, what did you mean by this, and and uh, and why is it so? If it's so, well, I don't know. I'm obviously, it's maybe not the worst mistake, but in, in in my experience, and and by the way, now maybe it's important to kind of define what I mean by a friend. So if I there's sort of a you know friend from childhood or, or something like that, then so I think the danger with like you know founding companies or any kind of teams with those type of friends is that, I mean, oftentimes, like, at least for me, like, you know, friends are people who I obviously I like, you know, we are oftentimes, we are very like-minded, uh, and, and, you know, that just means that I, what I would worry about, like, founding company with friends is that, you know, that, you know, there are, I mean, I was talking about how important it, it is to have, like, these different type of perspectives, you know, like to whatever decision you are about to make, and if if everybody is a super like like-minded, and you know, have you have kind of follow a similar train of thought, then I think like so much gets gets lost. So I I think it actually is, it's almost the opposite if I think about the you know the teams that I've been personally been lucky to be part of or, or teams that I've observed from distance. Mm. I mean, oftentimes they, they are made of like pretty different people. Mm. They, they do bring different perspectives and there actually can be like very heated arguments about things. But then, as I said, like despite all of that, these people can get aligned behind that one common vision. And, and you know, there's this mentality that, you know, you, you just, you know, disagree. Uh, but you commit uh, even if you disagree. Right, right. And it gets more difficult if it's a person who is, is really close to you and you have known uh, him or, or her for years. Exactly. And, and the chances are that you won't disagree in the first, first place, like almost on anything, which I think would be a problem. Right. Maybe leading from there, uh, one thing that is special um, in the founding team of Supercell and also uh, at Vault, uh, where you're in the bo- as, as the board member, is, is, is the fact that it, uh, you had six people on your founding team. Um, what kind of like challenges or benefits this kind of approach where you have like, you, you, there was you obviously as the, as the founding CEO and pl- plus five other people. What kind of like benefits or challenges having these many founders uh, may have? And is there a golden number? How many, how many founding team members one should have? Well, first of all, I, I don't think there's a golden number at all. I, I think it really depends, like what you're trying to do, and and, and you know, so of course, depends on the type of people you have. And I, I guess I can only like speak from an experience of Supercell. Like the the, the simple reason for us to have like uh, as many as six co-founders was that uh, you know our goal was to like just uh, you know Supercell. The, the founding idea behind Supercell was that the best people and teams create the best games. So mm-hmm. therefore, we wanted to sort of uh, get. First of all, we wanted to get the best people uh, to the founding team, but two, we also like wanted to get people who know our sort of quote best people in the industry. And collectively, like the six of us, of course, like knew lots and lots of people, which then enabled us to like build the next layer of, of great, amazing people—people people who were actually much better than we were uh, to Supercell. How about super concretely? When you have that many people on your founding team, and you have like every day, you have probably tens of different decisions to to be done. And when you have six people, one could argue that you have a committee. Kind of like, how did you, during your supercell uh, early days, kind of like agree what to do? How did you make the decisions? How did you agree what happens? And maybe what is your advice for, for those, uh, not just only having maybe six, but just three? How the founding team should make decisions and how maybe you should pre- prepare your team to actually move super fast um, and so on? Well, first of all, I think it's extremely dangerous to make decisions as a committee. Mm. Uh, and, and you know, for us, how it worked is that there was a complete trust between the, the six of us. And it's not that they kind of decided everything as a group. Of course, you know, if we had to decide something about the product, uh, you know, I, I actually like oftentimes I wasn't involved because I don't think I'm the best person to talk about product. So I excluded myself. But then the people who were best uh, people to kind of chime in on those decisions. Then those guys, you know, made the, uh, had the discussion, made the decision, and let everybody else know. And and then of course, if, if somebody like disagrees, then that's the time to kind of speak up, and then they will talk about it. But I I, I think that first of all, I mean, I don't think that all decisions like should or or you know are, are needed to make within that bigger group. Right. And and I think the one benefit that does come out from like having a bigger group of co-founders is that I I already mentioned one, which is that you just like jointly just you just know more people. But the other thing is that you know we were, we're actually able to execute super fast because I mean I was the only 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 one out of those six who wasn't a game developer, and all of these five other people were like world-class game developers, which meant that you know we were able to move super super fast also on the product and technology side. 
Right, right. Um, maybe every founding team is unique, and depending on what you're building, what's the problem you're trying to solve, there are different roles. But maybe one thing that holds is, is the role of the founding CEO in the founding team. So in your view, kind of like, what are the most important like, traits or character characteristics or skills uh, specifically the founding CEO should hold uh, in the founding team? And what's the role, responsibility? Yeah, so I have sort of mixed feelings about this question and, and topic because, I mean, oftentimes I feel that we have some kind of created, also within startups, we have created this like myth about this hero CEO who like somehow magically like knows like, you know, what's the best thing to do and solves all the problems and, you know, works harder and smarter, better than any, anybody else and all that, which I, and, and I, at least in my case, none, none of those things are true. You know, if I think about, say, for example, the, the founding team of Supercell, I was just like super, super lucky to be able to work with these five other people. And I definitely don't think it, it, it was about me. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't about me and still isn't about me. So I, I think sometimes I think that role is almost like, you know, somehow we've it, created a Glor myth, myth about it. <laughs> yeah, glorified. Yeah, glorified it. Um, but, but then uh, what, what do I think is the job of the CEO? Uh, like in my mind, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, the way I think about it is that the role and the kind of responsibility of a CEO is to one, like first of all, make sure that you have the best possible team. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, you have world-class individuals in every single thing that the team needs to do. And, and then of course that that team sort of, kind of plays or works very well together. Uh, that's one thing. And then the other thing that you need to make sure is that the culture is such, you know, where a team and everybody else can do the best work of their careers. Mm. And whatever that means. But, you know, that, that really, I mean, if you have those two things, then with, with uh, some luck or, or with a lot of luck, which I, I, I certainly had, then, you know, great things can sort of kind of come, come out of that. And, and in, in very practical terms, I, I mean, I think recruitment is a super, you know, critical competence that the CEO needs to have. So you need to be like somehow able to like kind of sell your company or inspire others so that other great people would, would, would join it. And of course, you need to have an eye for recruitment and, and you know, what, what, what are the kind of, type of types of people that uh, should join the company. Um, and then it sort of comes to decision making. My kind of thinking about that is that, I mean, I don't think that C, it should be the CEO who makes all the decisions. Rather, I think that it's the responsibility of a CEO to make sure that decisions get made. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, in my case, I only make decisions when the team can't get to decisions. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes you just need to step up and say, okay, we're going to stop this argument and no, this is not what we're going to do. But in most cases, you know, of course, it's best if it, decisions do come from the, the team. Right. Uh, the second thing you mentioned, um, the role of the CEO, is, is to ensure that the culture is, 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 is right and, and fostered. Um, so, what are the maybe the super concrete things you should do uh, in the founding team to set up your culture in the right way before you actually start running and finding the product market fit for, for, for your, for your uh, product? Well, maybe I, I can share you a, a kind of true story about the found, founding of Supercell, where I think I got like some things right, and then I got some things very wrong. Mm. Uh, so what the part that I think we as a group got right was that we actually talked like so much about culture, actually before we founded the, the company. We literally, like we, I remember this one of our very first meetings, you know, was that we actually went through the culture deck of Netflix, which had like, just come out, I think, maybe a year before. And I, you know, and, and actually I and the others were also like very inspired about that deck. And it talked about, you know, this culture of freedom and, and responsibility. And we like uh, basically like ins that inspired us actually to like many of the things that we wanted to do at Supercell. Mm. So, we, so, we, so we, we spent so much time like not only talking about the type of game and product we wanted to build, but talking about what type of company and what type of culture we want to wanna build. So that, that was the thing that they got, got right. Mm. The thing that they got wrong was that, uh, you know, it was in my like to-do list always that, okay, you know, write down the values, like write down what they kind of had agreed on, mm. you know, and kind of formalize in a way the, the culture. It always, I, it was on top of my to-do list, but then I was always like too busy with like, other more important stuff. So I never did it actually. Until it got to this point that I, I fondly remember this moment, like we were, I think, like around 40 people. We had already like opened up, for example, our office in San Francisco. So it not only just one, but two offices and all that, a bit more complex environment. And then I was uh, in this meeting and we talked about 
responsibility, which kind of happens to be one of our values. Mm. And then the other person next to me, in a way, uh, uh, he was talking about responsibility. It actually was something completely different, what I had in mind, what I meant with responsibility. And then that was a, a big wake-up call for me, but okay, like, I actually like, really need to get onto this, and it, it actually is important to like, write this stuff down. Because when you can write things down and you share it with everybody, you know, that's a one way to make sure that everybody is actually aligned, and it, that kind of forces discussion on what you actually mean. And I actually think it's, it's, um, it's very important to actually get pretty detailed about this, this, this type of things. And you know, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, oftentimes culture can feel very fluffy, and the reason why it feels, feels fluffy is that you keep it very high level, very conceptual. Like for example, like, um, like everybody, like all the companies in the world, probably like in one way or another, one of their values is quality. I mean, have you ever met a company that, do, that isn't like uh, trying to do the best mm. quality products? But you know, when the question is that what does it really mean? And for example, at Supercell, what it means is that the action and the behavior that comes from quality mm. is that we kill a lot of canes. And that's painful. That's mm. incredibly painful. But you know that that's that, that's like that, that that is what we mean the quality. And you know, uh, you know, we've I think we've learned that you know these values don't really mean anything unless mm. like some very concrete actions follow from from them. And if you have a value in your company and you can't figure out like what is the action, then the question is that is it a value like in the first place? Should it be there? Mm. If if there are no concrete actions that fo follow that value, like why why is it there? Mm. And I think that was maybe. Partially, at least, the reason why you, why what happened in the early days of of Supercell, kind of like you killed one game, you kind of like heavily pivoted to to mobile and so on, beca and because you knew that this wasn't going to be as big as you have agreed and as ambitious. Was that the part part of the? Yeah, I, I think like uh, that too. But maybe the biggest reason was and was that because we, I mean, we we had a very high level ambition and still have at at, at Supercell and. And you know, we our strategy was that um, we wanted to create games for the masses, and and then like we back in 2010, the obvious platform to start from was Facebook. But then we relatively quickly quickly discovered that you know that you know for us like we're never going to be the number one company on the Facebook platform. And then mm. I, I I do remember we had this discussion that okay, we gotta like I mean if, if we can't win this game, like let's try to pick a game that we actually can win, and that's what kind of inspired us to do the pivot to, to mobile. So right. we got super lucky there. Right. So, so we have a, a bit more than four minutes left. So there's a couple of things I want to especially ask. So when you find the product market fit, you, you maybe start to scale from, from the three, four, five people to 10 to maybe 50 at some point, and, and then to eventually 100 to 200. How does the role of founding team change d during that process? And, and what's the kind of like... How, what's kind of like the importance of founding teams when, when, they, when the company grows? Uh, well, I think like uh, how the role of a founding team changes, it really depends on like, you know, if the founders have been put into kind of leadership positions or managerial positions. Mm. So maybe you have somebody who's like, uh, you know, for example, leading the engineering mm. and, and it's, it, it goes just fine. Then there's maybe four or five engineers, but what happens when there's like 40? Or 400, mm. and then obviously, like you know, there is such a thing that you know, like if, at at some point, you probably need somebody like who has experience in doing that type of thing, or like maybe you've been, may, or maybe you've been lucky that you have somebody in the founding team who's so so passionate about leading other people and not just writing code, but that that somebody can grow into that role. But you know, oftentimes you see 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 sort of changes in in those types of things, and and again, I I think this uh, this is a really great test for the founding team. So the best founding teams like have no egos. So it doesn't matter what is your personal role in the company and in the founding team. All you want to do is do whatever is best for the company or, or best for the team. Mm. And, it, it, and it, it doesn't matter what's your kind of personal role. And, and you know, I've seen like so many times people sort of quote stepping down on their roles because they see that there's somebody else in the company who actually is better at this job than mm. I am. And those are actually like really big cultural moments and certainly have been for us whenever that happens. Yes. When you build a company, it's, it's, it's already incredibly difficult. And, and on the journey, there will be different conflicts with the founding team. You don't always agree with everything, and that's great, as you mentioned. Um, but what are maybe the typical conflicts that you might face with your founding team when building a company? And is there something that the very best and exceptional founding te teams do differently when they face a conflict? 
Well, I think the conflicts, obviously, it, ma it depends like what type of companies. There's probably like millions of different types of conflicts. And as you say, there should be. I, I, my advice would be that embrace the conflict. That's a great thing. Mm. I, mean, I mean, the fact that there are, is conflict is a really, really good thing. Um, because then you, oh, the, then you can get different perspectives to be, to, be, uh, to be matters. But my very simple advice, like whenever there's a conflict, and if, especially if you start to feel that you're losing trust on somebody, you know, sit down with that person or with, or with those people and talk about it. Take the bull by the horns. And this, by the way, is one of the, uh, I think, differences between sort of great teams and average teams. Because for average teams, these discussions are so hard that they just don't have them. It's, mm. it's so inconvenient to mm. talk to somebody about these types of things. Uh, but the great teams, they embrace it and, and they do that. And, uh, I, for example, I fondly remember one meeting in 2012 before Supercell re released Heyday. And they had a founding you know, group meeting. Of, of six of us were sitting in the lunch area. And then you can imagine, like, I mean, they had, like, I, I believe they had like, amazing like, you know, uh, developers in our founding team. But then they have one of our founding coders tells to the other founding coder, but hey, I, I have to tell you that I think you're coding too slow mm. and in front of everybody. Mm. And, and I still remember that. But you know, that, you know, I think that's a great example how you can raise a bar. And I, I guarantee you that the other guy wasn't slow at all. <laughs> and it was probably the first time in his life that you know, somebody tells you that. But that, I think that's a, like a, that's a sign of a great founding team. So we're challenging you know, the other people and, and you're kind of helping ra ra uh, them raise the bar. <laughs> right, right. And not afraid of a conflict. Exactly. Super shortly, uh, if you would start another company, another startup, how would you approach building the founding team in super short? Yeah, for clarity, I'm not going to start a, a, <laughs> a, new, a new startup, uh, but like the way I would, would, would do it is that uh, first of all, I would like, you know, uh, gather like a group of people who I think I potentially could start that startup with. Uh, I, I would try to form a vision mm. with those people and then I would use this vision formation process as a test like is this a great uh, great founding team and, and you can they get aligned how is how does this process feel to me you can iterate on that and, and, and then like through this process you probably will discover that okay is it a great team or not what changes need to be made etc and once you kind of arrive to be kind of a the final team, okay, this is it, uh, then I think I would just, as I said, I would write down the vision, the plan, and don't forget to, to write down the, the culture, and then just, you know, put, let go. That's it. Thank you, Ilko Planen. Thanks very much. <laughs>